And uh, let me be the first to welcome you uh, and say Merry Christmas. It's uh, that time of year, and nobody else can tell me different now because Thanksgiving is over, and I can, uh, I can have the high ground now. Um, you know, <clears throat> I love this season. I love this season for a variety of reasons. Um, I love it because it is a season of hope. It's a season of anticipation. I remember when, when I was a kid, um, uh, definitely not now, <clears throat> definitely only when I was a kid, I would always shake the presents to try and figure out what were in those. I definitely don't still do that. Not, that's definitely not what happens. Um, anticipation is fun. Uh, you, you, get to, you get to play around. You get to, you get to wonder, what, what's it going to be like? And maybe you even have expectations. Um, one of the things that's fun to do with, with anticipation and expectations is, is pranks. Um, my, one of my other favorite holidays is April Fool's. Um, and you have this, this expectation that, that, that things are going to go a certain way and all of a sudden they're twisted. Uh, we've done classics like uh, you know, setting the clocks to the wrong time and making people think they're, they're late. We've done all these sorts of things. Um, my favorite one uh, is, well, I, I got started a little early. I've played a prank on my wife. Uh, she, uh, I, I decided I was going to go through and take all of her spices in her spice rack and switch them around. And she hasn't figured it out yet, but the time is cumin. Okay. Um, and see, you should have anticipated a bad joke, and that would have been better. Anticipation makes a difference. What we expect and what we hope for changes how we receive what we're given. This morning, I want to talk about the hope of the people of Israel, the expectations that they had for what Christ, the Christ should have been, and then contrast that a little bit with what they got. Uh, to talk about this, I want to talk about four specific groups of people. The first is the Pharisees. And Lyle actually hit on them pretty good this morning. He talked about the do's and the don'ts. They, they had a list. They had their hope. They had their confidence in their ability to keep the law. They had their hope in their righteousness. They said, if I can do enough good things and not do enough bad things, then I, can have, then, then I have hope. Then I can make it. None of us ever have hope in our own self-righteousness, right? That's not where we find our hope. But the Pharisees aren't the only group of Jews. There are other Jews called the Sadducees. And they were, were very different than the Pharisees. For one, they didn't believe in miracles, they didn't believe in angels, they didn't believe in the afterlife, uh, but they were primarily associated with the temple. And because they were primarily associated with the temple, they were obsessed with political power and riches. They thought uh, if they could play the game, that would be their source of hope. See, the Romans occupied... Uh, the, the territory there, and, and they were in charge. And, and, and so the Sadducees said, well, if the Romans are in charge, well, we're going to play their game. We're going to uh, adopt their culture. We're going to, uh, we're really going to put all of our eggs in their basket. And by playing the game, we can have hope. By chasing that paper, we can be fulfilled. You know, sometimes I think we try and find our hope in playing the game. When we try and find our hope in how big our bank account can be, or, or how stable our retirement is, or how uh, by, by maybe conforming to the culture in some way, by, by following the crowd, by playing the game, we can get ahead. Sometimes we put our hope in playing the game. And so the Pharisees found their hope in, 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 in their, their righteousness. The Sadducees found their hope in playing the game. Then you have another group of Jews called the Essenes. 
They were a group who uh, were priests. They were associated with the temple. But when the Sadducees started playing their game, they weren't having any of it. And so they said, we're going to go out and worship God in the desert by ourselves. We're going to keep ourselves pure. We're not going to associate with any of that filth. And some of us find our hope, try and find our hope, our confidence in the same way. We isolate ourselves from the very people that God wants us to reach. It, uh, it blows my mind that people find it, found it surprising that Jesus was hanging out with sinners. Where else would he be? Because there's not any one of us here who don't fit under that definition. And so the Essenes, they went off, they started their own community, they kept themselves pure, and they said, if we can keep ourselves pure, that's going to be our hope. We can wait for God to act climactically, but we're going to hold out. We're going to hunker down. And there was one more group, the Zealots. The Zealots thought they would find their hope in military power. The Zealots were, would be the equivalent of modern-day terrorists. They were, were religious uh, war. They, they, they were fighters. If a Zealot found a Sadducee, in a dark alley alone, he would kill the Sadducee. They w opposed Rome with everything they had. They believed that the Messiah was coming and that he would finally take care of the Romans, that he would sit on the throne of David as the prophets had prophesied, that he would be the might, their savior. That's where they had their hope. They expected that all of them expected that, that someday God would set everything right, but we're going to have our hope in these things in the meantime. With this sort of expectation, when you think about how God finally acts, how he finally breaks into the world to redeem it, to be their hope, it's no wonder they missed it. Turn with me, if you will, to, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. See, this isn't what they expected. The way that this story starts out is, is a, a proclamation from the emperor. The, the face of Rome. When the emperor speaks, the world moves, and it does. They, they go to their own homes. They, they, their, their lives are uprooted. They have to do this because the emperor is powerful. This would already upset the zealots. They say, no, 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 the, the, the Messiah doesn't, doesn't when, the, when the emperor says jump, the Messiah doesn't say how high. But he moves. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was in the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his, his betrothed, who was with child. Pause. Those two words should not go together, betrothed and with child. You see, when Mary gets those good tidings with great joy from the angel Gabriel, he's saying, no, you're going you're gonna to have you're gonna, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will conceive a child and, and we know how that turns out we know that he's the savior but to everyone else looking on it's a source of shame in fact Joseph being a, a kind man he was, he was actually going to divorce her in secret so that no one would know what had happened he, he didn't believe what she had said until an angel comes and, and tells him that no, no, this really happened this way. And so to an outside observer, this child who's going to be born to a not quite married girl in the middle of Nowheresville 
at the whim of an emperor doesn't sound like the beginnings of a great story. And yet, this is how God chooses to act in the world. Verse 7 says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Not only are, is, is this, uh, you know, a child born to a not quite married young girl, it's born to a not quite married young girl who's out on the streets, essentially. Uh, she, there, there's nowhere for them to stay, and so they stay in, in a stable, which would probably been more like a cave than a, than a, than a nice little wooden structure, and, and laid in a manger where the animals would eat or drink out of. And this is God. Emmanuel, God with us. God in the flesh enters the world not riding on, on a white horse with swords drawn to defeat the enemies, but as a child to a, to a couple who's out in the cold, who the community looks down on, who no one expects anything from. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And so there's a couple things we can say about these shepherds. Uh, one of them is that uh, this tells us a little bit about the time when Jesus was born. Um, I'm the biggest fan of Christmas there is, um, but I will be unfortunate to tell you he was born in the fall. <laughs> um, he, he was born in the harvest. And we know this because of what this says. It says the shepherds were laying out in the fields. In the Israel, I don't know if you've, you've seen many pictures of the Middle East, but there's not a whole lot of good farmland. Uh, and so the farmland, if, if the animals are in the farmland, the fields, uh, before harvest, that's a no-no. Uh, Afterwards, they would make deals with the, uh, after harvest, they would make deals with the farmers to let their uh, animals graze in the fields, and it would kind of fertilize the fields for the next, uh, next crop. And so uh, right after harvest is about the time that, that he, would have, he would have been born, because the shepherds are not in the wilderness where they normally are. They're in the fields. Uh, and so he's in the fields, and... Uh, they, the angel comes to these shepherds. Verse 9, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were filled with great fear, and the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom, with whom he is well pleased. When the angel went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they... <laughs> When the angels finally show up and celebrate this, they don't show up to the, the, the authorities. They don't show up in the temple. They show up to a bunch of nobodies in a field. Shepherds were, were very low status in the ancient world. And here they celebrate with, with not the emperors or the, or, or the priests, but with the poor. It's not what you would expect. And they celebrate and they, they, they say, go and see him. And they do. Verse 16, with haste, they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God, for they had all heard and seen as it had been told to them. This is how God chooses to act decisively in the world. 
He sent a baby. Announced it to nobodies. He didn't just send a baby. He sent a baby to a family that would have been kind of shamed. And not just a family that was shamed, but a family that was put out. This wasn't what the Pharisees were expecting. This isn't about righteousness. This is about, (laughs) in fact, if they looked at Mary, they would have thought that she'd already checked off several of the no-no lists. This isn't about the the Sadducees. This isn't about playing the game. This isn't about power. This isn't about the, the status. This isn't about keeping things pure. He's laying in, in a, a feed trough, for goodness sake. There's, I don't know how many stables you've been in, but it probably didn't smell very good in there. This isn't purity. The Essenes missed it too. This isn't, this isn't mighty. This isn't military. This isn't about power. The, the, the zealots ha, have, have missed it too. Their expectation was that God would, would <laughs> he'd act like we would. But his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Because the love that God demonstrates in this is not that he comes in his glory, but that he comes in his weakness. And the beauty of that weakness is that because he comes in weakness, comes wrapped in flesh, it is, it is a, in a way, say, he, he joins us in our weakness. That as we fail, that as we struggle, we know he's been right there with us. I'm reminded, as I think about baby Jesus, about my own daughter, in those first few hours, it was actually pretty scary because she, she, uh, she tried to die in the first few hours. She tried to suffocate. And I, I can remember... I can still remember her struggling to breathe. And I think about little Jesus, maybe in those first few hours, those breaths, how weak, how frail. Not what we expect when God acts decisively. I want to read you something. This is, I didn't write this, but I think it's, I think it's profound. He said a baby. Didn't see that coming. Oh, we knew he'd send something or someone, and it was going to be awesome and terrible. And truth be told, we deserve terrible more than awesome. For a thousand years, we gave lip service and not much else. We worshiped ourselves, did our own thing. We hoped for a king who would destroy our enemies. We overlooked the fact that our sins were just like theirs. But sending a baby? What was he thinking? We wanted a sword-swinging, curse-flinging, doom-bringing king on a big horse. We got a baby. Born to an unwed mother in a nowhere town in a shabby room. Maybe we weren't the only ones who didn't see that coming. The devil didn't seem ready for it either. I mean, none of it really makes sense. Baby, Nowheresville, father goes absent, 12 unemployed guys for his posse, religious people opposing him, nailed to a tree, naked, humiliated, right in front of his mother. A wall from the tomb a few days later. He came as a baby, one of us. He walked with us, ate with us, loved us, told us to do what he did. And then he told us we're good. What a story. Not what we were expecting, but exactly what we needed. That baby was God and King and Savior. Who knew? Not me. Didn't see it coming. Thought he'd come with fire and all cheesed off. We deserve no less than hell. He gave us heaven. That baby, wow. He was more than a baby. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. 
What I love about the unexpected nature of the gospel is it, that it's not just this reckless, uh, audacious moment of, of, of God taking on flesh in the past. It also calls us to make that part of our story. I, I'll tell you what I mean. The hope of God did not come in all these things that all these different people were expecting, on all these things that we also put our hopes in. It came in a quiet, sacred moment with a child in the dark. I believe that the gospel of God shows up in those quiet, sacred moments. Maybe it's that, that moment, that sacred moment. And sacred, it's, it's, it's a word we throw around sometimes, but, but what it means is of God and uncomfortable. Uh, those two things at once. The opposite of sacred is not profane, it is mundane. Those sacred moments where you swallow your pride and say, I'm sorry. The gospel of God shows up. Those sacred moments where you, you sit with someone who's lost a loved one and don't say a word. The gospel is found. Those quiet moments. Not in the big things. We expect God to, to act with power and, and glory. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm not going to call him out by name because I don't generally do this, but I saw something uh, this week uh, from a popular uh, TV preacher uh, that, that infuriated me. Uh, he was talking about uh, how God wants to be glorified, and because he wants to be glorified, uh, he's he's going to bless you and make your life great. He said, "What would it what would it honor God if uh, I didn't drive? Would it honor God if I didn't drive a nice car and wear nice clothes?" And I I, I sat there and I went, "Are you kidding me?" When God Himself showed up, it wasn't in a Ferrari; it was in a manger. That's the glory of God. And it's that glory that he calls us to share. And look at, look at uh, Philippians chapter 2. Paul invites us here to join God in those quiet moments to spread the hope of, of the gospel of weakness, the gospel of the crucified Messiah. Verse 1 says, So if there's any encouragement in Christ... Any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. So now I'm going to talk about this is the mindset of God. This is the mindset of the Son of God as he came. He says, you, you should have this mindset. Verse, verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality of God with God a thing to be uh, grasped or held on to, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, Paul says if you want to have the love of Christ dwell in your heart, you need to humble yourself like Christ humbled himself. He went from glory to baby. <laughs> from power to weakness. And that didn't just stop at, at the, the incarnation. Didn't just stop there in Bethlehem. That is how he lived his life. Anytime he could have done something for himself, he did things for others. 
They come up and, and, and they surround him and, and they, the, the, the crowds always, always gather around him. He never failed to have compassion and to love. He never failed to meet people where they were. He was humble. Humble even to the point of death. You know, humility is a word I think gets twisted sometimes. Um, because if you're humble, that doesn't mean that you have low self-esteem. Don't, don't, don't hear me say that. I don't want you to beat yourself up. That's not what Christianity is about. The world will do plenty of beating up on you for you, okay? It does, you don't need help with that. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Letting the priorities of the kingdom take precedent over your own priorities. That's what Jesus did. He said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. This isn't what I want. I don't want to die. But not my will. Your will be done. One of the profound things that I think we do when we pray the Lord's Prayer is we, we say, let your, uh, your, your kingdom come. He says, then your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is a call to put our self second and God's kingdom first. That is where our hope truly lies. And as we follow Christ and his example, as he said, pick up your cross and follow me, we too can have that hope. This morning I want to close with a prayer. I want, to, I want to close our time with a prayer this morning. Uh, it's a prayer we, we know. It's a prayer that, that Christ taught us. Because I think it, it, it tells us our hope and it gives us our mission. Not only should what we should expect from God, but what he expects from us. Would you stand as, as, as we, we pray together? Let's pray as the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven... How would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you have a need, now is the time. Would you come as we stand and as we sing?